Grand Rising, my friends. Welcome back, and as we get more prepared in our everyday performance, we can start to think about what we want to do. And here we're about positive and positivity and positive reinforcement. So go ahead and write something nice about somebody that you admire, that you love, respect in the comment section, and then forward them this video and say, hey, go look in the comment section. I wrote something nice about you. And that way we're trying to play forward some of that positivity to make every day uh, a better day. We're going to get involved and deeper and deeper into the mysteries and the histories of the world. Today, we're going to start off with, for the first time in recorded history, smoke from wildfires reaches the North Pole. Smoke from wildfires raging in Russia has reached the North Pole for the first time in recorded history. Data captured by satellites flying over the region reveal Friday's show just how much smoke is being produced from the hundreds of forest fires in the Sekha Republic in Siberia and just how far that smoke is spreading. NASA said in a release issued over the weekend, they said smoke blanketed the sky for about 2,000 miles east and west and about 2,500 miles north and south. And the North Pole is, I won't say only, but is... 1,864 miles away from that region. So for it to cover 200, sorry, 2,500 miles is easily going to reach up to the North Pole. The wildfires in Siberia are already an out-of-the-ordinary occurrence. The Sakhar Republic, also known as Yucatia, is covered by boreal or snow forests, and its northern region is one of the coldest places on the planet. In June, some parts reached a ground temperature of 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit and an air temperature of almost 90 degrees, 89.4 degrees Fahrenheit. So the day Siberia is having heat waves and forest fires, we should definitely know that uh, some of the decisions that we've made and have been making are not probably for the best, and we need to be thinking about how are we going to change to improve that, not just for ourselves, but for our children and children's children. And discuss a little bit yesterday about looking forward to plan to possibly colonizing, if not other planets, other uh, celestial bodies or stellar bodies or uh, human created um, places out there for us. But moving on, it's official. Cryptocurrency is infrastructure. Is infrastructure. So one of the most important things out of the uh, negotiations last week in the Senate was the fact that the cryptocurrency and regulation was being snuck in as part of the infrastructure package. Now, for us who have been in the crypto market for some time, we already know that it's definitely part of infrastructure is just as much as the financial system is part of the infrastructure. Senate is a much older average age of the individuals in the Senate is 64.3 years compared to the House's 58.4, which is not that much of a difference. And it plays out in terms of who's investing in cryptocurrencies. So American investors already are showing increasing interest in cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Among adults with $10,000 or more invested in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, either within or outside retirement funds, 6% said they own Bitcoin, according to the same recent Gallup poll. That's up from 2% who said the same in May of 2018. The number climbs even higher to 13% for investors under the age of 50. Gallup likens current Bitcoin ownership levels to gold, which 11% of investors say they own. So there's still some, let's just say, not being completely or even moderately happy with the language that went through in the Senate bill. It still has to pass the House. Um, it may have to be, uh, some of the language may 
have to be reconciled between the House and the Senate before the president will sign it. So we will keep a close watch on this space, of course, and on the negotiations that will take place in the House next before this bill is signed. And then also the implementation of the bill uh, will be something that will be interesting once it is signed by the president. BitMEX will pay $100 million in penalties to Feinstein and the CFTC. So BitMEX is an exchange that you were able to, to trade in Bitcoin and um, also speculate on the futures of Bitcoin with derivatives. They made it to where if you were a U.S. citizen, you were supposed to uh, be region blocked, not able to access their website because for several years now, the United States has uh, declared that they did not feel. And it discusses it in this article further about the anti money laundering safeguards or um, know your customer protocols. They felt that BitMEX was not using sufficient measures to stay on top of that. And a lot of people in America still traded on BitMEX, uh, allegedly, uh, via using uh, uh, VPNs, virtual private networks, because there was basically no um, KYC, know your customer uh, verification that was taking place on BitMEX. The, was he the CEO, the former CEO, Arthur Hayes, an American uh, guy was uh, on the run for a while from the American authorities, finally turned himself in. I think he paid like a $10 million bail. And part of all of this is just getting it set up to where BitMEX will be able to continue to operate. They paid off America the $100 million, and now they will be able to... Um, Institute some uh, probably better measures of uh, know your customer, anti-money, money laundering uh, protocols and measure safeguards. And from this, they will be able to stay in business. BitMEX is a big, giant exchange. A lot of trading in Bitcoin when there's downturns in the market take place on BitMEX. I uh, keep a BitMEX um, open just because I like to. And I'll show you. Like to look at the um, I like to see like how to, how Bitcoin is being traded, and so I'll sit here and, and look at the candles, get a sense of Bitcoin is doing pretty well right now. Standing with crypto, we talked a little bit previously about how Cardano will be starting their smart contracts, uh, exchanges, decentralized finance, non-fungible tokens, NFTs on their chain soon. And this is actually an advertisement from ADAX. So we'll take everything with a grain of salt. But ADAX is going to be a decentralized exchange within the Cardano ecosystem saying it's going to be a trustless protocol with an enable censorship resistant token swaps within the Cardano ecosystem, make full use of social sentiment based trading tools and ensure ample asset liquidity through unique liquidity pools. So yesterday we talked a little bit about previously about definance, liquidity pools, the being able to loan money to liquidity pools, which then are able to grant loans to individuals uh, who are willing to Pay interest on that and you gain earn your yield. So on Cardano, soon there would be their own uh, decentralized protocols, decentralized exchanges, ADAX. It appears to be one of the first. Very excited about how Cardano will respond. Uh, Cardano actually has been doing really well uh, price action wise. Today and maybe at the end of each episode, we'll come back to um, Coin Market Cap. Take a look at prices now, but Cardano is doing great the past day, over twenty, on oh, close to twenty eighteen percent in the past twenty four hours. 
NASA awards a $10 billion cloud computing contract to Amazon Web Services. So we talked about stocks. If you haven't invested in Amazon now, it's a little bit expensive now, but Amazon will continue to do well in the future. Besides, a lot of people don't, are not even aware, besides their large retail, online retail business, they also has a very large software service uh, organization and infrastructure business, a business model that they follow as well. So previously, the United States government and intelligence communities had signed a $10 billion contract with Microsoft for the JEDI contract, which was for cloud computing. Now, there was a lot of, and Amazon um, sued, said it that they felt that there was unfair pressure on the intelligence agencies to select Microsoft because of the former administration's uh, contentious relationship with the ownership of Amazon, I think is a, a fair way of saying that. It, try to avoid both parties uh, tearing heads off. And so now uh, the National Security Agency awarded this $10 billion cloud computing contract to Amazon Web Services. The That classified data repository is known as the intelligence community's GovCloud, it was reported in 2018, the platform is described as being a big data fusion environment into which the agency aggregates much of the intelligent information it collects. According to a 2020 report that appeared in FedScoop, intelligence community GovCloud ran on premises as of last year. So it's looking like the government is looking to modernize the intelligence community's GovCloud using hardware as a service and bulk price cloud compute solutions. The modernization effort is reportedly called the Hybrid Cloud Initiative. In here, it talks about that it appears that uh, the CIA will also be awarding cloud computing contracts as well that may be in the, up into the tens of billions of dollars. And then there, they awarded a cloud contract known as the Commercial Cloud Enterprise to Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Oracle, and IBM. Is expecting to spend tens of billions of dollars on the contract. So these are, if you're wondering where is going to be guaranteed money for companies in the future. These are the things you need to be reading about and thinking about. You see that at least for the next several years, well, for the previous one, um, Jedi was $10 billion over 10 years, but this is going to be tens of billions of dollars to these companies that they'll um, be able to bank on. Speaking of the military and moving on a little bit to health concerns, SOCOM, which is Special Operation Command, is testing an anti-aging pill. So our Special Operations soldiers are testing a molecule to see if it, here we'll say, these efforts are not about creating physical traits that don't already exist naturally. This is about enhancing the mission readiness of our forces by improving physical characteristics that typically decline with age, Hawking said. And Hawkins is Navy Commander Tim Hawking, SOCOM spokesperson. Essentially, we are working with leading industry partners and clinical research institutions to develop a nutraceutical, pharmaceutical nutraceutical, nutraceutical, in the form of a pill that is suitable for a variety of uses by both civilian and military members, whose resulting benefits may include improved human performance, like increased endurance and faster recovery from injury. Now, the molecule that they are looking at is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or NAD+, which works in the body to help regulate the polarization of the cellular membrane in the, I don't want to get too down a rabbit hole, but so it keeps the uh, positive and negative charges in the right place in the mitochondria, which is the power plant of the cell. So it's like the, 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 the part of the cell that creates the energy. So it's a big part of the part of the cell that creates the energy of regulating it and also producing ATP, which all the cells use for energy. So NAD plus, apparently there's a uh, deficiency that occurs as we age and by replacing it is linked with um, improving age-related functional decline. 
So by, it can be mitigated by both preclinical evidence suggests disease and age-related functional decline can be mitigated by boosting NAD+, which supports the Metro International Biotech hypothesis that maintaining optimal NAD plus levels may allow humans to lead longer and healthier lives. So we will, A, we, we in, in this case, we, B and me, have already started taking NAD plus after I read this article, but we will definitely keep an eye on the data that comes out of this research. And it's a lot of, if you already looked, there's a lot of literature that already talks about the benefits of NAD plus. So, like I said, this is neither health, nor financial, nor anything advice. This is just me blabbering into a microphone and recording myself like an insane person uh, and just talking. And if you, whoever listening is listening, do or don't, hey. Scientists have discovered a link between gut health and age reversal. And so this was done in mice where they basically took the bacteria of younger mice and put it into the uh, the gut bacteria of younger mice and put it into the um, the gut flora of older mice and saw some improvement in uh, cognitive function and behavior. Now, now this is going to be a bit of a rabbit hole, and I'm not going to go down too much of this rabbit hole right now, but. There is a huge relationship between the your intestines and your brain, your cognitive function, your your mental state. You know, for millennia, we have talked about how the your brain is your second, um, your stomach is your second brain. There are more serotonin receptors in the gut than there are in the brain. That's why when you feel nervous for some people, they start to feel it with the sensation. We say butterflies in the stomach. They get that fluttering sensation. It's a two-way street. And this plays out in your mental state can affect your appetite. And the food you eat and your nutrition can affect your mental state. And a lot of data and information is coming out showing just how powerful this connection is between our digestive system and our mentation our cognitive abilities so you are what you eat eat healthy believe in the positive uh, nature of the universe and that things will come to pass that are supposed to pass and this is how you kind of i don't want to say hack the body or trick the body but you increase your chances of having a healthier existence so we're going to stop there today Thank everybody for joining me again and having fun. We're going to keep doing this over and over and, and see where we go. I, I enjoy talking about these things I read about every day and know that I love you and love yourself. God loves you. And that's all that matters.